when you back a right-wing nut for your reasons, when, and they come to power, you, they, you think you were using them, but they think they were using you. You, you get the image? Okay? So what Brzezinski and, and Madeleine Albright, who was Clinton's, became Clinton's Secretary of State, when they, and, and Madeleine Albright is from Czechoslovakia, yes, okay? And, you know, it hit me that she was essentially doing, she and Brzezinski, who's from Poland, okay, were essentially doing what the German capitalists were doing in 1929. It's, you know, it's deja vu all over again, as the, as the saying goes, you know? In other words, the right wing of capitalism backs a right wing fanatic against the left. The Mujahideen and the Al Qaeda. Yeah, yeah, right. And okay. it blows up in our yeah, faces years up. later. Because, as I say, when you back one of these fanatics, when they come to power, they, you think they, you were using them, but they say, thank you, we were using you, now we're going to do what we're going to do. All right, and that's the 9-11 truth that we've got to learn. In New York City, I've been speaking with Lenny Brenner. I think back to the journey that really brings me here. I think back to September 11th. I was a 20-year-old college student when 9-11 happened. And I was in front of my television set, watching the, the towers fall over and over again between mugshots of an Osama bin Laden with a beard and turban. And I began to realize that this new face of the enemy, this beard, this turban, this man looks like my grandfather looks like my cousin, looks like my family. Sorry. And suddenly we became the ones who were the new enemies. Just a few days later, I got the call from a family in Arizona that a Sikh man had been killed. Obir Sinsodi was murdered in front of his gas station by a man who called himself a patriot on September 15, 2001. He was the first of an estimated 19 people murdered in the aftermath. Hundreds and thousands of people caught up in hate violence, hate crimes, hate incidents. His story provoked um, a response in me because I knew again what was at stake for him, what was at stake for his family, and what was not showing up in our evening news. And that uh, recognition of what was being pressed down, what was being drowned out by the anthem of national unity, uh, caused me to run into my bedroom, lock the door, and hide for days. And I hid, and I hid, and I turned to, and by the way, I was a student of international relations and religious studies, and I turned to the only text that could make sense uh, of what was happening. I turned to Harry Potter, <laughs> and I began to read, and I read all three Harry Potter books there, trapped in my bedroom. And somewhere between page 287 and 288, I began to realize that I prefer the black and white world in this book compared to the grayness outside of my bedroom window where Americans were killing other Americans. And I began to realize that just as this violence was happening and unfolding right now in real time, uh, it resonated with the stories my grandfather used to tell me, the stories of the 1984 Sikh riots in India where 3,000 Sikhs were murdered alive, where uh, in the 1947 partition of India, uh, Hindus and Muslims having to flow the largest, most swiftest violent migration in human history. Uh, thousands of Sikhs lost their lives. My great uncle was killed alive, burned alive in the, in the lumber yard in those riots. And how these stories were never in my history book. Um, and I realized that so too, what was happening right now wasn't going to be remembered, documented, realized, recognized uh, that people in my community had the same sense of desperation as the men who leaned over that table just a few hours ago, wanting their stories to be heard. The importance of the story and the importance of drawing close to the storyteller's mouth.
hearing what's at stake for the other. And so as I began to see that I had this choice, I could go back to my university and do nothing, um, or I could go out and document these stories. <laughs> and as soon as I had that idea, I was showered with a thousand doubts. Here I was, I was only 20, I had no film credentials, I didn't have a college degree. Uh, I'm third generation Sikh American, which means I've often felt like an outsider to my own community. And why would they trust me with their stories? Who was I to do such a thing? To go out and document them. And this gulf, this, this, these questions created this sort of gulf of fear in front of me, and I don't think I would have been able to cross that gulf of fear alone if it weren't for the voice of my grandfather coming back to me, giving me the heart of a Sikh tradition. Nam da nishnan. In order to realize yourself, in order to realize God, you must act, here and now, without fear. And so I did. <laughs> I got in the car with my cousin, he was 18, I was 21, I was 20. Um, I pretended like I was 21. I had a list of questions, he had an old beat up camera, and we just drove across the country in the days and the weeks and the months after September 11th into the heart of the whirlwind. From coast to coast, through the south and midwest, and we captured stories upon stories upon stories. And I can share just a few of them with you today. I'm standing uh, at ground zero, and the rubble is still smoldering. And I'm there with Amrik Singh Jabla, a young man with a turban and beard, Brooklyn accent, born and raised. And he's telling me about that morning, that Tuesday morning, when he arrived at work and saw the towers burning. How he began to run for his, run for his life with hundreds of other people. A woman falls, he bring, helps picks her up, gets her on her way. There's blood on his clothes. He stops to catch his breath, but he looks across the street, and three men across the street look at him, point at him, and say, hey, you terrorist, take that turban off, and begin to chase him. Amrik Singh Jawa finds himself running for his life for the second time in 15 minutes the same morning. I'm standing in San Jose with a small Muslim boy. His name is Samir. He's about seven years old. And he's talking about how the kids at school call him Bin Laden's son over and over again. They take their lunch pills and they smash their lunch pills in his face. And I say, well, you know, how, how does that make you feel? What do you want to tell them? He says, I, I'm not a bad guy. I'm a good guy. I want them to know that I'm a good guy. I said, OK, OK. Uh, what would you do if you saw the bad guys? And he says, oh, I'll beat them up with my karate. And I say, OK, well, how would you know they were the bad guys? He says, oh, they'll, they'll be wearing turbans on their heads. I'm standing in San Diego with a Sikh woman. And uh, she's still shaken from what had just happened to her a few weeks before. She was standing parked at a stoplight when a man pulled up next to her, opened the car door window, held a knife over her head and said, this is what you get for what you people have done to us. And now I'm going to slash her throat. Swarn Buller uh, emerged bleeding. Uh, luckily, a car had pulled by and the motorcyclist left the scene of the crime. But months later, she jumped at a, a loud noise. After all of these stories, story after story, where hundreds, the FBI reported that hate crimes went up by 1,600%, where Sikhs and Muslims and Arabs and Arab Christians and South Asian and Hindus and Latinos with brown skin, the racial category was so huge, where all of these communities were starting to report what, it's, what, was, what it was like to be subject to violence by people who suddenly saw them as the enemy, as the other, as here is the line of who counts as American. You fall on the other side, you're automatically floored, and you're automatically suspect. You can't help but let these stories get inside of you, turn you bitter, make you angry. I had one last story left to find before I completed my documentary project, and that was uh, the widow of Bilbiri Singh Sodi, the first man who was killed after 9-11.